Hello and good morning. Welcome to the lecture seven of folklore and culture studies. My name is Abhilash and I am a student and a folklore and uh, culture studies enthusiast. I hope you all are enjoying the journey with me. All right. Uh, let's quickly do a status check, a progress check of where we stand. So what I'm doing is I'm following the MA IGNU curriculum. And right now we are uh, in the folklore and culture. That's the first section, folklore and culture conceptual perspectives under which we are in block one, folklore issues and methods. And under block one, we have unit one, which is uh, definition, function and genres. We are done with unit one. Currently we are in unit two. Uh, lecture one, two, three, four are unit one and unit two starts from lecture five and six, right? So let's do a quick, uh, check of what we've covered in the previous lecture, which was uh, the lecture six. In lecture six, we did cover W.G. Toms and the word folklore and folklore and ideology. So if you've, uh, you know, if, if you are watching this lecture for the first time, I s strongly recommend that we start watching or listening to these podcasts from uh, session one or lecture one so that we don't miss out the flow, all right? And what do we have in store today? We, I, I'm going to help you with that as well. Today, um, before, before we, you know, I tell you what we have in stores today, if you, I just have a recommendation that if you like these videos, if you like these podcasts, I strongly recommend that you subscribe to this channel so that every time there's a, you know, a new video gets uploaded, you get an instant notification. And why should you be spending time uh, in listening to these lectures is because if you are a student or an enthusiast as well, this will add a lot of value. And if you follow these sessions, um, you know, in a structure, you don't have to make notes. All you have to do is I'm making a journey easier. That's that's the reason why you should be listening to these lectures or podcasts. So without much ado, let's get started. Uh, give me one moment. Here you go. All right. So today, what do we cover? Today, we shall cover different academic approaches. Uh, now, what, what is an academic approach? An academic approach is how different people uh, or different, um, you know, Associated people with folklore and culture had different approaches, academic approaches, which means a structured study approaches. And there were differences in opinions as well, different thoughts as well, which we will cover. So there are seven academic approaches. In today's uh, session, we will only cover three. And in the next session, we will cover the rest, rest four. We'll, we'll see how we progress and basis that we shall cover, you know, uh, what we have. But to start off, what's the topic for today? The topic for today is different academic approaches, out of which the first approach that we have is the mythological school of approach. Okay, so let's quickly get started. So after the works of Jacob Grimm and the first uh, theoretical perspective in, in study and analysis of folklore was put forward by Frederick Max Muller a profound German philologist, right? We've already identified what is a philologist. A philology is a study of languages, their origins, right? And Indologist as well. He was an Indologist. Now, what's an Indologist? Indology or Indologist is someone who studies Indology. What is Indology? Is derived from the word India. So someone who studies uh, Indian history and culture is an Indologist. So who was Max Miller? Uh, Max Müller was a profound German philologist, which means, you know, he studied the origin of, um, you know, the language, the German language, uh, the perspective of the language. And he was also an Indologist and a great Sanskrit scholar. Isn't that interesting? Max Müller drew uh, on, on linguistic viewpoint to explain not only the meaning of myths, but also the process of myth creation. What So what was Max Müller's contribution from a folklore and culture perspective is he drew, uh, you know, he was, you know, because he knew he was a student, uh, you know, he was an Indologist. 
uh, and of course he was a philologist as well he could draw a connection or he had a strong opinion from a linguistic viewpoint why because it was study of philology philology is a study of language and the perspective of their origin so he, he could draw he could draw a connection there right uh, being an author authority on comparative religion comparative re what is a comparative religion is comparative religion is a concept where uh, people study different religions and find a comparison so they find commonality and differences as well that is you know study of comparative religion so uh, being an authority on comparative religion max muller strengthened the comparative methodology and the diachronic approach of uh, uh, jacob grimm J jacob grimm to formulate what was known as mythological school of folklore studies so what's a di diachronic approach diachronic approach is something which study of a particular culture or a particular thing over a period of time for example the population right or census for that example census is a diachronic study right so for example uh, census gives us an idea of the number of people and other parameters as well over a period of time. So Jacob, uh, you know, with Jacob uh, uh, Grimm's of diachronic approach, Max Muller strengthened the comparative uh, methodology, right, to formulate what was known as the mythological study of uh, mythological school of folklore studies, right. So his theory attempted to know what did he do, right. His theory attempted to explain the phenomenon of myth creation. Right? How, how did the myth creation thing happen as a result of the semantic changes in the languages? Semantic changes in the you know, every what what's a semantic change? Semantic change is the usage of uh, how you know this same thing we use different words in different times, right? Uh, for example. I mean, to give you an example, let's say few things which which would convey the same meaning, but f the same words would convey a different meaning in different uh, times. Or uh, let's say the same word would have different shades of its meaning. So that's semanticism or semantic changes in the languages. So, you know, to give you an example, let's say um, the word telegram right so for most of us now telegram is no more than a messenger messenger app but let's say if you go 40 years ago 50 years ago telegram was a post postal process right so for example you know if i would telegram you uh that used to happen through the postal then i'm talking from an indian postal perspective right if uh, i would want to telegram you i would send a message to the postal team the postal team would send a telegram the postman would come and uh, you know give you the telegram so and telegram was very expensive usually it was charged by letters and that's the fastest medium then that time but in today's day and age obviously it's a messenger app so that can be an example of uh, you know semantic language that's one perspective of it the other perspective is um, for example, different words would have different meanings, right? The, the, the shades or the definition could slightly differ. There's, there could be subtle changes um, of those subtle changes in meaning of the same words. So why am I sharing this is because this is the theory which uh, uh, Max Muller tried to explain or Max Muller tried to add. And he used the phrase, the malady of language, the disease of language to mean this this change in language which is exactly what you know i spoke about which is a phenom phenomenon where words and uh, terms used by a primitive man at a particular stage of one language lose their original meanings at a later phase the example of telegram you know is a classic example at a later phase of the language and at the hands of later generations right something which was relevant back then or you know decades ago or centuries ago may not be relevant now and that is that is exactly what you know max miller's contribution or idea or what he coined the term uh you not coined he used this phrase mal malady of language this disease of language now disease in this case uh, he refers to the changes occurring in you know different times so that's that
So myths are created according to Max Miller as the explanatory narratives of such words and expressions by the later generations. This mythological school, which was championed mostly by Max Miller, a few and a few other scholars too, he wasn't the only one, however, were abandoned in the later, later times as its reconstruction of the prototype myth was uh, proved to be hypothetical. So there was a lot of hypo, you know, uh, it was hypothetical that there was no enough concrete evidences and therefore, although, uh, you know, uh, it was originated or it was strongly put across by Max Miller and a few other scholars too, later, uh, you know, these were abandoned in later times. That's what this says. However, mythological theory is to be credited for being the first of its kind to attempt theoretical interpretation of folkloric forms such as Smith. So which means this, this society or this theory, right, or this school of thoughts, um, you know, was first of its kind to attempt a theoretical interpretation of folkloric forms, right, such as Smith. They were the first of their times. And also the work uh, of Max Muller was highly productive in shaping the methodology in the study of folklore. Right. So his work was highly productive in shaping the methodology in the study of folklore. So that was the first school or the first academic approach, which is the mythological school. Um, I hope, um, you know, you liking this uh, team. Um, by the way, if you have any suggestions or feedback, right, uh, do let me know the comment box is open. Do share your thoughts in the comment comment box. If you like it, do like the, do hit the like button so that I know that uh, we are on the right path. And if you think we things can be done differently, or if you have any ideas and suggestions, I'm open to ideas and suggestions as well. But uh, right now I'm a trainer, not a mind reader. So, <laughs> so unless you tell me, I wouldn't know if you you know want any suggestions. So on that note, I also want to let you know that you know if you have any artifacts related to folklore and culture, for instance, in the last two days, I've posted a couple of uh, artifacts in the form of videos. Right, I hope please do watch them as well. And if you do have some artifacts, right, uh, do share it with me, and of course you will get the credit. I will mention your name. That way, the community, right, we share. So not just we study, not just we cater to the theoretical part of the, you know, sub uh, uh, of the subject or the study of the journey, but we also will cover some of the practical aspects by sharing those artifacts, right? So that's that. And with that, let's move on to the next um, theory or the next academic approach, which is the diffusion of the migration theory. So it's in the previous one in the mythological theory part. Max Muller was a was a man, and here we have Theodor Benfi, right? Was another German philologist. So uh, Mr. Benfi was also a German philologist and orientalist, orientalist who is best known for his uh, compiling the great Sanskrit English dictionary. So you know he's best known for his compiling the great Sanskrit. English dictionary, right? So isn't, isn't it interesting to see someone from Germany, uh, you know, comes and compiles what? A Sanskrit to English dictionary. Isn't, isn't this thought interesting in itself, right? However, he made no novel contribution to the theoretical and intellectual development of folklore studies through his translation of Indian anthology, right? What's an anthology? Anthology is a collection of either poems or um, some other forms of writings as well. So let's read this again. However, he made novel contribution to the theoretical and intellectual development of folklore studies through his translation of Indian anthology, the Panchatantra into German language. It, isn't it interesting? He translated the Panchatantra into the German language with a highly comprehensive introduction in it. Wow. Now, Benfi deciphered fascinating similarities between Sanskrit tales of ancient India and the tales of Europe. So he, you know, he identified or deciphered that uh, there are fascinating similarities between Sanskrit tales of India, of ancient India, 
and tales of Europe as well. He opined, or opined as he gave his opinion, he, op he opined that such similarities would not necessarily, due to generic relationship uh, of people, um, you know, as thought by Max Muller. So Max Muller's thought was, um, you know, all these similarities comes because of the generic relationship be uh, because of people. However, Ben Benfi, Theodore Benfi had a different view. Put forward the idea that the folklores can can and do travel across territories. So it's not restricted to a particular group or a region or a territory. It can and it has traveled and it does travel across territories and boundaries. And which is why these tales and stories uh, of ancient India were similar to those, those folklore tales in Europe as well, back in those uh, um, day and age. He believed that it was ancient India, right? Now, this is Theodor Benfi's, uh, you know, thought. He believed that it was ancient India where the folk tales were originally produced, which later migrated to Europe and other parts of the world through various means of cultural contacts between people. This is getting interesting. Right, he believed that the ancient India is where all the folk folk uh, folk tales were originally produced, and which later migrated to Europe. How did it migrate? Uh, not just to Europe, to other parts of the world through different through means of cultural contacts, means of cultural contacts between people. So there were, which is a proof that there were cultural contacts back then, and because of the cultural contacts, the folklore stories traveled, migrated. Right. Further, Benfi also attempted to construct the exact routes. He also sort of attempted to construct the exact routes through which such folk tales migrated from India to the rest of the world. Right. So this idea of uh, monogenesis or um, atomistic origin of folk tales and other folk tales can be seen as a central theme of uh, central theme of the works of uh, philologists uh, since uh, Jacob Grimm and Max Miller. What does it mean? What is monogenesis? Monogenesis, mono is one, genesis is origin. So, you know, so which means that the, the idea that all the folklore uh, tales originated from India, that is, that conveys to the, to the idea of monogenesis, uh, right? And so that remained the central theme of the works of a philologist since after uh, you know Jacob Grimm and or not after from Jacob Grimm and Max Muller that remained the central thought or the central idea. Benfi's theories and methods influence in later times the historical geographical methods in Finland as well. So that was about uh, the diffusion of the migration theory, how stories migrated from India to different parts of the world. We've already covered the mythological school. So these are the two approaches. And the third approach that we will cover today is uh, that is the anthropological perspectives. What is anthropology? Anthropology is the study of human societies and development. We've, you know, in, in I think one of the previous lectures, um, we've studied that how folklore was a was a annexure of subjects like history and anthrop anthropology and later took shape and it became a separate subject in um, um, itself. However, there's a lot of um, common things between anthropology and uh, folklore and culture studies as well. And this also forms one of the perspectives. So let's try and understand what perspective it forms. So the rise in anthropological scholarship in the 19th and the 20th century in India, sorry, in England and America, brought out a strong anthropological perspective in the study of folklore. And what does it mean? It means that in the 19th and the 20th century, the rise in anthropological scholarship. So there were scholarships and studies in the 19th and the 20th century, anthropology, and in England and particularly in England and Amer America, that brought out a strong perspective in the study of folklore. In fact, Anthropology and folklore studies as academic fields share almost the same types of subject matters with differences only in perspectives and emphasis, right? Which is what we've discussed. So 
almost the subject matter remained the same. It's just that in certain perspectives um, and in certain um, values, emphasis is strong points of values where these two subjects could differ uh, or differ. However, there's a lot of similarity between these two uh, subjects. Folklorists typically have been studying the orally and verbally transmitted cultural resources more than the other type of resources through more modern folklorists to do and encompass the study, the uh, encompass the study of people's customs, material, culture, resources, and art forms. Now, what does it mean? It means that folklore typically the study of folklore, you know, um, Folklorists have 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 been have studied the the oral and the verbal culture which has transmitted through you know cultural resources. So that was initial. However, modern folklorists also, apart from the oral you know oral and uh, transmitted cultural resources, the modern folklorists what they cover is they also co cover they study people, customs and materials, uh, cultural resources and art forms as well. So that is the difference between the early folklorists and the modern folklorists is what it says. However, this, spe uh, this special attribution to oral tradition is not a feature in the work of anthropologists who study the material and the non-material aspects of culture from functionalist from from functionalist viewpoints and see the cultural norms and values as predictable patterns of human behavior what does it mean it means that this particular oral tradition uh, oral tradition in the sense uh, uh, you know let's say there could be poetries or poems or you know stories which which have transformed orally from generation to generation may does not form a part of anthropology and because that the, the you know what they feel is the cultural norms and the values are predictable pattern of human behavior so that's understood as what the anthropologists think and which is why it's a different perspective some of the four uh, foremost scholars of uh, classical anthropology drew heavily upon the folkloric uh, resources which they collected through exhaustive field works in distant distant places and diverge communities now what what they're saying here is some of the four most uh, scholars of classical anthropology so classical anthropology scholars the foremost scholars they sort of uh, heavily drew attention on folkloric resources what are the folkloric resources which means all those resources which they uh, which they collected through their uh, field works for example let's say to study a, diff a particular um, community they, they would travel to travel to a different place right and if they come across any object that that although that was a part of folklore they also um, heavily dependent uh, they were heavily dependent on those resources for study as well. Some of the, that's that's what the statement means. The names which can be mentioned, some of the prominent names, uh, you know, in this line who've collected those resources, although they were in, uh, you know, anthropology, but they collected such uh, resources through heavy field works. Some of the important names are E. B. Tyler, Andrew Lang in England, uh, Franz Boas. Uh, Ruth Benedict, M.J. Herkowitz in the United States. So these are the prominent anthropologists who also collected some of the uh, folklore materials or folkloric resources through their study of anthropology. E.B. Tyler, in his famous book, Primitive Culture, advocated that folklore understood as customs and beliefs of the peasant societies could be work studying in reconstructing the collective human activities of the primitive times wow this this is amazing right so what does a taylor what uh, tyler says is uh, he advocated that in his book primitive culture advocated that folklore understood as customs and beliefs of the peasant societies could be worth studying in reconstructing so let's say if there is ever a reconstruction of how the collective, uh, you know, societies lived. So these these collections, uh, or folklore and culture plays an important role, is what M Mr. Tyler advocates in his book. 
Tyler and his follower Andrew Lang explain the similarities between cultural traits and practices amongst communities living in different geographical locations through the new concept of anthropological evolution of mankind. Let's read this again. Tyler and his follower Andrew Lang explain the similarities between cultural traits and practices amongst communities living in different um, living in different geographical locations, which means they try to explain similarities between cultural traits and practices. So let's say uh, there are two communities in different parts of the world. They are never connected. But what these guys did is they tried to show those similarities between the cultural traits, right? How? Through the new concept of anthropological evolution of mankind. So that was a concept is what uh, both of the gentlemen told us. In sharp contrast to this idea of monogenesis, monogenesis is one origin. So there was, so it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't carved in stone, that thought, right? There were contrast to it as well. And what was the contrast? In sharp contrast to the idea of monogenesis and an atomistic origin maintained by Max Muller and Theodore Benpreet. So that was their thought. This anthropological school uh, put forward the notion of polygenesis. Polygenesis is origin could be from different, uh, could be a cultural am amalgamation, right? And multiple origins, right? Uh, of cultural uh, and folklorist traits. According to this notion, a cultural trait, then what is their notion? A cultural trait or an item of folklore could have independently originated at two or more places unrelated to each other, either at the same time or a different time, but at similar stages of human process. Now, what these guys are saying, Tyler and Andrew Lang, is their, their thought process is... Now, these are anthropologists, and their thought process is very different from the other two gentlemen, Ben Free and Max Muller. Their thought was monogenesis. These guys, you know, think that it is, can be, you know, polygenesis as well, which means two cultural uh, uh, or two communities may have a similar cultural trait or uh, could have independent origin. So they could be, you know, they could be independent of each other in terms of the cultural traits. Um, it's not necessary that they have to be related to the each, each other either at the same time or at different times as well. Um, but at similar stages of human progress. So the human progress is the same as what these gentlemen said. Uh, even if it is a different time, the process of evolution or the whole human progress is the same. Therefore, the cultural, um, you know, traits could be similar. Like Max Muller's concept was everything originated from India and traveled through different cultural contacts. They differ. It's not necessary that, it, that this has to happen is what our anthropologists uh, Andrew Lang and E.B. Tyler feel. So that is uh, this thought process. So it was believed that evolution of a mankind followed a singular universal path of progress in every place, right? So the, the evolution of mankind followed a singular universal path. So therefore, the, the, the concept of cultural contact and transmission of um, culture is not necessarily true with these with the uh, three absolutely identical stages everywhere right so so they've also identified these stages you know every every human progress ha follows these three stages is what the other two gentlemen feel which is savagery savagery is when you're cruel to each other and then you know you have barbarism barbarism is where there is no place of culture and uh, there's there's no rule there's no culture right and then comes a civilization where people form groups, there are rules formed, there's a, you know, particular things are followed in a particular fashion, right? Organized. So this is a stage is what these guys, you know, uh, feel irrespective of region. This is how all uh, human progress is what E.B. Tyler and his follower, Andrew Lang, have to say. And this is another academic approach as well. So just to summarize, what did we cover today? We covered different academic approaches. We've covered the mythological school of approach. We've covered the diffusion of migration uh, theory. And the third one, we've covered the anthropological uh, perspective as well. And in the next session, we will cover with there are four more uh, approaches. 
or uh, school of thoughts, we will cover those as well. And uh, so that's all we have today, have for you all today. So I hope you guys are enjoying these sessions and lectures and podcasts. If you do, please, um, you know, you, you might consider to subscribe to these uh, sessions as well. That way we grow as a community. You can help each other as well. Right. So with this, uh, we come to the end of the session. And I will see you soon in the next session. Take care and goodbye.